Welcome to another episode of the Christian Combatives Podcast. I am your host and servant in Jesus Christ, Paladin Actual. I know we've done a few serious topics lately, and I wanted to do something a little bit more lighthearted today, something a little bit more enjoyable, and something that people keep pestering me to do. So today I'm going to be talking about furries. Did Jesus die for furries? And I'm going to be going into a few clips from a Seinfeld episode in which David Putty, a character from Seinfeld, acts out his Christianity, and we're going to look at this and listen to it and uh, try to dis determine if he's a if he's a good Christian, a good Christian role model or not. Uh, who's going to stop me? It's my show, and I don't get paid for it, so <laughs> let's get into it. All right, so first topics first is, did Jesus die for furries? Now, the reason I came up with this question is because I get asked on a, on a regular basis, uh, every once in a while, I'll, I'll, I'll be talking with people online, and I'll bring up the fact, I'll say, you know, I was having this conversation with this uh, this Eastern Orthodox furry on this on this one thing, and they're like, ooh, man, you talk to, you talk to those weirdos on the internet? And then I spend the next probably 20 minutes to two hours explaining to this person, as I have done to every person, uh, that Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the world, and that includes people on the internet that they'd rather not associate with. Now, there's a, a, a bunch of complaints a bunch of complaints that people have about this. Um, they're usually, I mean, again, the most common response is like, oh man, that's weird. Uh, but then I've, I've had some complaints where people say things along the lines of, well, you shouldn't be associating with him at all. Um, they're not a Christian. They're not a Christian at all. And, and I would direct you to the YouTube video, uh, Is It a Sin to Be a Furry? Where I explain uh, the ability to both have hobbies that people find weird and be a Christian at the same time, how you can have strange hobbies and not be sinful in, in pursuit of these hobbies. And the question that I have devised to ask for those, uh, to ask to those people who, who question my online associates is, did Jesus die for furries? And it's, a, it sounds like a really silly question. It is kind of a silly question, but at the same time, if you're saying that you, as a Christian, should not associate with these people who you believe to be so sinful, then did Jesus die for them? Like who, who should you be associating with? Now, I'm going to pull up here a Bible verse, and this is Luke chapter 5. Whoa, let me see. Yeah, Luke chapter 5, verses 29 and following. 29 through 32. And Levi made him a great feast in his house, and there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at the table with him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Ew! And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So if your argument is that you shouldn't associate with these people because they are just so sinful and so gross that God wants nothing to do with them, you got you, you got to take up that argument with Christ. Because if Christ went to these, you know, these sinners and tax collectors, maybe, ju just maybe, he loves people who need salvation. He loves people who are, uh, who are outside of the, 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 the usual group for salvation. Now, this is an interesting comparison to make, but this is something that came up in conversation before. What about something like prison ministry? Why would you associate with, with prisoners, with criminals, with people who have gone through the justice system and come out the other side, and the justice system has declared that they are guilty? Imagine that, murderers and the like. Would you associate with them and bring them the gospel? Should you do that? Did Jesus die on the cross for somebody like Barabbas, like the thief on the cross next to him? Did Jesus die on the cross for the worst people in society that they too might be saved? And if he died on the cross for the worst people in society, did he die on the cross for some teenager with autism who draws cartoon animals on the internet? Or did Jesus say, you know what, I died for murderers, I died for sinners, and of course I died for all the good Pharisees, but I did not die for that guy who draws cartoon animals and plays make-believe. That's just, that is the unforgivable sin, apparently, that, that, that God would not want any of his Christian fellows to associate with car cartoon, cartooners, cartoon, <laughs> cartoonists, 
<laughs> not don't associate with them. And, and, and by the way, by the way, if such a standard is laid out for those those people who have cartoon animal drawings uh, on the internet, I would say that whatever that standard is probably also extends to those who watch other kinds of cartoons. So if you like superheroes, if you like your Japanese anime and mangas and all these other things, I'm sorry, you're in the same camp as the furries, somebody that God apparently doesn't love and doesn't want other Christians associating with. So if you're going to have a standard like that, then you have to apply it. You have to apply it consistently. So this is the thing. If you assume that this group of people on the internet should not be approached and you see with disdain that a pastor would dare deign to profane his holy and divine image, me, the high holy pastor, how dare I? Again, this is often seen as, as an offense, like, dude, you're a pastor and you're associating with this group of, of, of weirdos online? What is wrong with you? Like, like, there's something wrong with me that I like to talk about Christ with other people, other Christians, by the way. Many of them are Christians. Many of them are not Christians. Many of the people I associate with online, furry or otherwise, are not Christians. How dare I associate with such people? Well, let me pose it to you this way. Who needs to hear the gospel the most? People who already have the gospel? I mean, it's a benefit for me to hear, uh, to read God's word every day. But people who are languishing in sin and need a Savior need to hear the gospel. And where do you find people like that? Where can you personally find people in your life that have not heard the gospel, that have been perhaps overlooked online? This is, this is a pretty easy question to answer. Uh, so originally, for me, this was one of these things where, you know, I had the same I had the same perspective as, as many other people. As, you know, people would talk about furries online and be like, <laughs> ew, gross. You know, why would I associate with those with those subhumans, right? Uh, it was, I mean, it was really a, a disdainful and hateful perspective that I that, that I housed. And, you know, I, I spent plenty of time uh, bullying these 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 people on the internet. And some of them were, were really engaged in and entrenched in sin, and they should have been called to repentance, not just just picked on. Others of them, and this I found out later, others of them were just desperate for somebody to to, to discuss the gospel with them. You know, uh, Romans 10, 17, excuse me, Romans 10, 17 says, uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of God. In fact, you know what, let me, because I've got a computer in front of me, let me pull up Romans 10 right now, because I think this is worth listening to. Romans 10. All right. Um... Romans 10, 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, verse 14. And how will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? Okay? How are they to hear without someone preaching? If your concern is that these people are so far removed from Christianity that they are the social lepers, there's some pun there about leopards, that they are these social lepers, unclean, unclean, stay away from this group, this social group of people. They, like lepers, are the ones who need healing the most. If that is your argument, that they are the furthest from God's light, then that's where God's light needs to go. If that is your belief, then take them the gospel. Now, on the other hand, if your belief is more nuanced and you say, well, look, there are, there are Christians on the internet and there are non-Christians on the internet and there are kind of, you know, there's different social groups of people. And in this group of people, in among the furries, even among those lepers, those social lepers, there are Christians, there are Roman Catholics, there are Eastern Orthodox, there are Lutherans, there are Baptists, there are a lot of Reformed, handful of Presbyterians, one or two Methodists. I don't think I've ever met a, a, a Mormon furry, but that would, <laughs> that would be a different conversation. But there are so many Christians in this group, and they've been ostracized from, from other Christians. They, you know, iron sharpens iron. You are commanded, actually, not to neglect the gathering of the saints. And they often feel, you know, because of their social interests and their hobbies, they often feel that God does not love them, that the other Christians are others. They're not, that they're not part of the same, the same brotherhood, the same sisterhood, 
because of their hobbies, because of their social interests, because of the way they act or the way that they talk, and these things not necessarily being sinful in and of themselves. So my challenge to you is that, on one hand, if you think that this is a group of people who are so far removed from the gospel that a Christian should not even have anything to do with them, ask yourself who Christ interacted with. And if this is a worse group of people than that, did Jesus die on the cross for furries? I'm serious. Ask yourself the question if you have this aversion to dealing with or interacting with furries on the internet or any other group, really. I mean, I just use this as an example because this is a group that I continue to interact with, and I have many, many friends uh, in these in these groups, uh, many wonderful Christians, many wonderful brothers and sisters in Christ that I, I, I like to talk about all the time with the, you know, talk about the Bible with all the time. But this is a group that I'm familiar with, and I am sure that there are lots of other groups again, uh, out there. Again, I mentioned things like prison ministries and stuff, but there are less extreme examples where you can find groups of people who have been neglected by the gospel. You used to think about kind of missionary journeys out there, and people would be a missionary out to a land that didn't hear, like a physical location that didn't, you know, doesn't have a lot of knowledge about Christ. They don't have the gospel. How can they hear if nobody preaches it to them, right? And in the age of the internet, those sort of physical boundaries have broken down to a degree. Now, there are still, you know, areas out there where the gospel, where it's, an, an, it's I don't know, it's, it's a desert for the gospel, and they desperately need the gospel there. There are physical locations like that, but there are also kind of social locations online. Have you ever considered, so any, any, sort, of, any sort of social group, any sort of political affiliation, any sort of college or, you know, college group or anything anything like that. I mean, I don't need to give you examples, but you can think of groups where you're like, oh yeah, a Christian would not be wel- welcome in that, in that group. And that may be true. There are groups out there that are explicitly opposed to Christianity. But then again, some of those groups need the gospel. I'll give you an example. In, uh, in Europe, there are, let's say, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of Muslim refugees. There's a, I mean, there's a lot of camps. There's a lot of locations where a lot of Muslim refugees uh, congregate. They, 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 they kind of go together in you know, different societies in Europe. And there's large Muslim communities. Now, for a Christian from the outside, you say, well, Muslims are not Christian. They're, they're unbelievers. And many of them don't like Christianity very much. Many of them think that when we say Jesus is God and Jesus died on the cross for our sins, that this is blasphemy. So we shouldn't interact with them because they are the enemy. They're opposed to us, right? They're, they're opposed to you in, in terms of their ideology, in terms of their spirituality. And yet, and yet, there are Christians who are missionaries specifically to Muslims. This is true. There are Christians who are specifically missionaries to Jews. There are Christians who specifically, they, they are missionaries to Mormons. I know one of them. There are, so this idea that there are that there are these patches of people out there in society or in physical locations where Christianity is not well-known and not well-liked and should therefore be avoided is contrary to the gospel and the mission of Christ. You can find people that need to hear the gospel. And you will find in some of these, in some of these social groups, you'll find that there are people who already know the gospel. And they don't have as many people to talk with about the gospel as, as they would like, and they welcome you in as a brother. And that's a fantastic experience. So I guess the summary of all of this, I mean, again, the summary question is, did Jesus die for furries? And <laughs> it's such a great question because I know people are going to squirm when they hear it. Um, and I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And I'm not ashamed of sharing the gospel either. And I'm not ashamed of sharing the gospel with my beloved brothers and sisters in Christ who like cartoon animals. I'm not ashamed of that. I think it's wonderful. Thanks be to God that you have these believers in these different groups of society. And now, it just doesn't mean that I have to, you know, I have to think that all of their activities are, like, super cool. You know, I, I, I don't get the, the dressing up thing. Uh, no, it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't appeal to me. Don't, you're not going to see me in a suit like that, ever. <laughs> but at the same time, like, some people like watching football on TV for some reason. And for me, I'm like, Why? Why would you care about somebody else? Like, okay, fine. Maybe this is the best athlete in the world, and it's cool to see what the human body is capable of. But I don't care about football teams. I don't care about baseball teams. 
it, it's it's a hobby that people enjoy, and thanks be to God that there's some interesting hobbies out there that have grabbed people's grabbed people's attention, and then I'm sure that there's some cool, wonderful benefits uh, uh, of the hobby, some cool things that are you know put on display. Like, look at this. God made this person capable of throwing this ball this fast, this hard, this far, hitting this person. You know, uh, things like that. Yeah, I don't have to like the hobby to to acknowledge that there are that there are Christians who watch football. <laughs> And they were my brother or sister in Christ because they're Christians, not dependent on whether or not they watch football. But yeah, anyways, I thought that that was an interesting, an inter- interesting topic that came up today. I was just thinking about, you know, what am I going to do for the for the episode today? I had a couple of ideas, and this one came up um, uh, because because uh, somebody said something along the line. It was actually I, I quoted them. They said this. Um, uh, they said, "Not worth the time to talk to furries, especially about theology." Uh, they're a self-deluded cult centered around escapism. Nothing they think or say will be based on reality. At worst, it's a cult, which means their mind is split, and as Jesus himself said, one cannot serve two masters. At best, it's a cover-up for their, for their perverted cult portion. It Just writing off an entire group of people and saying, they don't need to hear the gospel, it's not worth it. You know, Jonah said something like that. Well, not exactly like that. In the story of Jonah, the reason he doesn't want to preach to Nineveh is because he is disgusted by the goodness of God. He's not, the reason he doesn't preach to Nineveh is not because he doesn't believe they'll repent. The other way around, the reason he doesn't want to preach uh, to the Ninevites is because he knows that God will have mercy on these on these disgusting, repulsive, horrible people and their disgusting, repulsive habits. And, oh, I am not going to bring the gospel to these people because I know what you're going to do, God. You're just going to forgive them and love them. And I hate them. And I don't want you to do that to them. That's not a very Christian attitude to have. You know, you should be desiring to share the gospel with people. And if some people need the gospel more than others, well, (laughs) then go give it to them. Go give them the gospel. Thanks be to God that you have been made aware of such such a ripe vineyard in need of a gardener, in need of gardeners, in need of Christians. Thanks be to God that you have been made aware of people starving for the very thing you have, faith in Christ, the gospel of Christ. See it as an opportunity, not as a, not as a reason to, to further ostracize a, a group of people. But anyways, like I said, this is, this is mostly going to be a lighthearted episode because of the subject matter, and for some reason, everybody just absolutely loses their mind every time I talk about the furries or the Christian furries. And I don't know what it is, but the moment that word is put into a title, everybody clicks on the video or the podcast episode. So I am absolutely going to capitalize that, and I'm actually going to talk, you know, I hope that I talked about something substantial um, when I was discussing this. In any case... That's enough about the furries for now. Um, I, I every once in a while somebody reaches out to me about this topic, and it it used to bother me that I'm like the subject matter expert on this, and it doesn't really bother me anymore because if I'm known as the guy who talks to the internet people and talks about the gospel with them, okay. <laughs> Okay, that's that's fine by me. There's plenty of other weird things about me that are much, uh, that are much. I don't know what I want to say worse, but <laughs> that are much sillier than he. Did you hear about Paladin? Actual, he talks with internet people, and they like cartoon animals. They even use them as their profile pictures. Can you imagine a pastor doing something like that? Talking with a person like that. There's much worse things. Uh, you know, I would <laughs> uh, much better to be known as, as the pastor who talks to the talks to the Christian furries and treats them seriously than the pastor who who can't stop after two slices of pizza and has to finish the whole box, right? <laughs> uh, but anyways, that's enough about that. Um, the other portion of today's episode. So this was a topic um, that I had I have queued up. So I've got a list. I've got a list, and it is 14 pages long of just ideas for videos or podcast episodes or whatever. And one of the things that I've been doing in the past is Hollywood, Hollywood gets the gospel right or Hollywood gets the gospel wrong and kind of uh, looking at different examples in movies or TV shows or, you know, whatever, and, and examining how 
how accurately they portray the gospel. In a lot of these cases, they portray a Christian or they portray a priest, and it's an absolutely horrible example of a Christian or a priest, but it's an absolutely accurate example of some bad Christians and some worse priests. In this case, um, there's an episode, There's I think there's actually a couple episodes in Seinfeld. Uh, this is this old show that us, you know, us boomers, um, us millennials, I'm actually a millennial, uh, us millennials watched on TV back in the day when you had to turn to Channel 13, UPN, um, and and at like 11 o'clock every night, Seinfeld would come on. And it's, and if you know what it is, I mean, everybody knows what the show is. I don't really need to explain it to you. Uh, but there's a character in the show, and her name is Elaine. Well, all the characters are hedonists. All the characters are sociopathic hedonists. And it's all a joke. But, I mean, the last episode really brings it out is that the, they're just the worst people. They're so awful to each other. And they have no principles. They're all just so selfish and self-centered. And there's a character in the show called Elaine. She's a female character, uh, one of the, the four friends or whatever that is, you know, the show's basically around. It's, it's a show about nothing, but it centers around four people who don't do anything with their lives. Uh, and the female character, her name is Elaine, and she is dating a guy um, played by Patrick Warburton. Uh, you, you'll, you'll recognize his voice immediately. He's the guy who plays Kronk in The Emperor's New Groove. Um, if you watch the Family Guy show, he's um, what, the dude in the wheelchair, the, the cop. Uh, I don't, I don't remember Jim or I don't know what the dude in the wheelchair with the big chin. Um, uh, he's got this, he's got this, this really man. I'm not going to try to do a Patrick Warburton voice cause he does it best, but he's got this really kind of manly voice vibe around him. And, and, you know, in the show for a couple seasons or episodes, Elaine's got him as a boyfriend. His name is David Puddy, P-U-D-D-Y. Uh, and at one point in this episode, she discovers he's a Christian. Now, all of them are... I think I think all four of the characters are like they would call themselves like non-practicing Jews or something. So it they're they're all basically atheists with pseudo-Jewish identity. Um, I mean Seinfeld is it's the last name and they live in New York, so it's not really out of place at all. But but Elaine in particular, I mean again she's a hedonist and she's and she's so self-centered like all the rest of the crew. So she's got this guy that she's dating, and she's like going through his car, his radio, uh, and he's got all these Christian music stations that he's listening to. Uh, and because of this, she finds out that he's that he's a Christian. Um, and and more importantly than that, she finds out he's a Christian, and then according to his religion, she that he, <laughs> according to his religion as a Christian, that she's going that she's going to be going to hell, and it's. She takes it in the least serious way possible for the worst possible reason. So I want to look at, at well, I want to listen to these clips of, of Elaine arguing with 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 her boyfriend uh, Putty, who's supposed to be a Christian, and I want to examine: is he a good example of a Christian? Even I know he's a fictional character. I I get it, but is he a good example of a Christian, or is he just kind of a jerk? Uh, and if you're familiar with the character, you're not going to be particularly surprised. But let's get into it with the uh, with the first clip of uh, Elaine talking to Putty. Do you believe in God? Yes. Oh, so you're pretty religious. I try. So is it a problem that I'm not really religious? Not for me. Why not? I'm not the one going to hell. So, um, I mean, he's, he's real casual about his faith, you know, well, you know, are you, are you religious? Yeah, I try, you know, <laughs> um, you know what, Ra rather than jumping into analysis first, I'm going to cut to a later, a later portion in the episode, uh, where he realizes that there's no newspaper that's been delivered to, I mean, he's, he's living with her, he's sleeping with her, um, uh, and uh, you know, as, as Christians are not supposed to do, and he realizes um, that they forgot to deliver a paper to her apartment. So uh, he asks her to go steal the paper from her neighbor's apartment across the across the the hallway. And here's what it sounds like. Well, and they forgot to deliver your paper today. Why don't you uh, just grab that one? But that belongs to Mr. Potato Guy. That's his. Come on, I get it. <laughs> Well, if you want it, you get it. Sorry, thou shalt not steal. <laughs> oh, but it's okay for me. Oh, what do you care? You know where you're going. All right, 
That is it. I can't live like this. Oh, no. Come on. All right, what did I do? <laughs> David, I'm going to hell. The worst place in the world. With devils and those, those caves and, and the ragged clothing. It's going to be rough. <laughs> you should be trying to save me. Don't boss me. This is why you're going to hell. I am not going to hell. And if you think I'm going to hell, you should care that I'm going to hell, even though I am not. So, <laughs> so there's a couple things to a um, couple things to unpack here, and, and and one of them is this expectation. And this I've had, I don't want to say I've had the same conversation, but there are people who uh, I stopped talking to because for one reason or another, I you know I stopped paying so much attention to them, uh, and they get mad. They say, "Well, you're aren't you supposed to? You're supposed to convert me." Or um, let's say, for example, I'm on the internet, like I shouldn't be. Uh, and I'm on a Discord server, and somebody jumps onto the Discord server, and they, and you know, moderator on the Christian server, discord.gg forward slash Christian, the Christ Court server. And the first thing they do when they jump on the server is they tag me and they say, convert me to Christianity. Prove to me that there is a God. You know, something along these lines. And this is, um, it's absurd for a number of reasons. First of all, I don't convert anyone. I, I may preach the gospel, I may even read the Bible, but I do not change anyone's heart. God does that. The Holy Spirit does that. I am not the one who converts anyone. And this argument that, you know, you know, you have an obligation to, to convert me. Well, I mean, later on, you know, other times in the episode, Elaine basically says that she doesn't, she has no intention of being a Christian. She has no intention of converting. You know, her heart is hardened as far as I can tell. I mean, again, fictional character, but... She has no intention of converting. The reason she's upset is that he doesn't care enough to convert her. Now, the cynical, the cynical analysis of this fictional character is, uh, well, let's not do the cynical version. Let, let, let's do the um, let's do the optimistic version. The optimistic analysis of this fictional character, Putty, is that he realizes that she has no desire to convert, that she is resisting the Holy Spirit, Act 751, as one can do, and that she's just trying to get him to kind of put on a show. Jesus, why don't you do some signs and miracles? That sort of thing. No intention of having faith or believing, but every intention of continuing to resist the Holy Spirit. Again, optimistic read of that would be that that, that Putty sees this, and he realizes this, and he realizes that he'd be casting pearls before swine, that she's just trying to have him perform for him and, and, and act like he cares about her, but she has no intention of, of coming to faith. More realistic, maybe pessimistic, uh, cynical analysis of this is that, you know, Putty's concerned about Putty. He cares about himself. He wants what's good for himself. Uh, and if she ends up in hell, well, that's not really his problem at all, is it? Uh, that's her problem. And there is a degree that that's kind of true-ish, but really awful. <laughs> Let me try to explain. To a degree, um, when people go to hell, it's not your fault. When people go to hell, it's because they they reject they reject uh, they reject the faith. That being said, there is an obligation if you have the gospel. There is an obligation for you to share it. You are supposed to 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 share. It. I'm trying to I'm trying to think. There's a there's a Bible verse about this, where um, it talks about it talks about. Um, let me see Bible verse. Um, let's see, is it unloving to warn people about judgment? No, there's, I'm trying to think of a phrase that I can, I can Google. <laughs> there's a Bible verse that talks about, um, about your obligation as a Christian to, to preach the gospel to people, to, to share the gospel to people. And that if you don't, that, that you're held accountable, that there is a degree of, of, of fault to you if if you allow somebody to persist in sin and to persist in unbelief and you do absolutely nothing you know to try to save them now again you none of us knows where that line is where you can say that a person is completely hardened their heart and they're not worth talking to anymore we know that that line does exist somewhere and god alone knows the heart sometimes you do walk away from a conversation after you've shared the gospel with somebody and they don't they don't listen and they're angry and um and sometimes the best thing to do is to walk away and hope that God works through that, you know, that gospel that has been given to them. But 
to to basically never to to have an interaction with somebody and and you know that they're in sin and you care about them or at least you purport to care about them and you never once share the gospel with them there is a, there is a degree of sin on your part there that you are called as a christian you know to share this light of christ you are called that that is your responsibility uh, again, this is a sin, but this is a sin that Christ died on the cross to forgive you for. So if you're thinking back of all the interactions with somebody, and you said, well, you know, I received a uh, change from the, you know, from somebody at, at the supermarket the other day, and I didn't tell them about Christ died on the cross for your sins. Okay, well, if, 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 that was, if that was a sinful interaction, then, you know, repent and be forgiven. But this is, I mean, this is more talking about, uh, about uh, that you've got, you've got a relationship with somebody, and you intentionally withhold the gospel from them, especially if somebody asks for it. That's that's kind of a giveaway. And not, I mean, you can tell sometimes when somebody's asking for it when they mean it in a cynical way, like, oh, why did you try to convert me? Huh? But you can't convert me. Bet you can't prove that God exists. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought, Christian. You know, the Bible has lots of contradictions. Yeah, that's right. Science says the Bible isn't real, and I trust the science. Like, there's there's that kind of person, but there's also the kind of person... Who they say? Oh well, no. I mean, I don't really know about Christianity because my, you know, my my mom was Catholic, but I don't. I was, you know, I wasn't. I wasn't raised Christian. And I, what? What are you talking about? What, what is this? What is your appeal? What is the appeal to Christianity? If somebody asks you like an honest question, there's a million different ways to go about it. If somebody is actually interested in Christianity, then I do think that you have an obligation to share it with them. Now, again, time permitting, maybe there's there's something that's going on that you need to take care of. You have responsibility, but. I, I think if you have the ability and you have the time, you, you should try. You should try to to plant that seed and at least maybe get them interested. And, and you say, look, look, I got 10 seconds. Christianity is all about faith in Christ. Christ is God, fully God, fully man. He died on the cross for our sins because we were sinful and we need somebody to pay that debt for us. Uh, I would love for you to come to church and learn more about this. I can talk to you more about this later. Um, I can give you a Bible and catechism, but I, I really got to catch this bus. So um, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you later. Church is right down the road. You see I'm pointing at it right, right there, that one. Yep, yep, I'll see you later. Yep, see you, bye. Like, if you're not at least, <laughs> I mean, that may be an extreme example, but if, if somebody is, is explicitly asking you about Christ and you refuse to share it with them, then that is, that is sinful, refusing to share the gospel with them. Now there's one final one final clip <laughs> from Seinfeld. Um, again, this 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 wealth of of knowledge of theology that is Seinfeld. Um, there is this this clip at the end with this you know awful priest. I assume he's Roman Catholic because he's got a collar, and I don't think Seinfeld is more nuanced to understand that different denominations have that collar. But I'll hit play, and um, so Putty and Elaine are again boyfriend and girlfriend living together in sin. Uh, and they're sitting in front of a, a, a priest to complain about the problem that Elaine is mad that Putty's not trying to convert her uh, to Christianity. Let me see if I understand this. You're concerned that he isn't concerned that you're going to hell. And you feel that she's too bossy. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah right. that's right. Well, oftentimes in cases of interfaith marriages, couples have difficulty. Whoa, 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 whoa. No one's getting married here. You aren't? No. Oh. We're just, you know, having a good time. <laughs> oh. Well, then it's simple. You're both going to hell. No way, this is bogus, man. Well, thank you, Father. Oh, oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, the flippancy with which this is all regarded is... I mean, that's... That's the humor. That's the humor behind it. But ugh. there is a degree of truth in the humor. This is why this is so funny. It's because this type of shallowness absolutely exists. There are people, I mean, Elaine only cares about this because Putty is not, is not giving her enough attention, is not caring enough about her. And, you know, Buddy is is so selfish and and so self absorbed in this whole thing that he doesn't even recognize that according to the Roman Catholic Church, he's committing mortal sin, which means that he is going to hell and he needs to go to confession and receive forgiveness. Now again, uh, difference between Lutheran and Roman Catholic in terms of forgiveness and repentance, um, that's one thing. But he is, I mean, 
you know, well, as a Lutheran, obviously, you know, thou shalt not commit adultery. Uh, that is a sin. And if you don't repent of sin, uh, Lutherans would say that any uh, any venial sin not repented of is a mortal sin. <laughs> so any sin that you that that you refuse to repent of does does end up being being a, a sin that sends you to hell if you are unrepentant in in your sin. So they're I mean they are playing with fire. And they're just kind of like, oh, you know, whatever. I mean, Elaine is is really happy after this clip because that means that they're both that they're both being judged. And this there's this perspective, and you'll you'll encounter this when you um, when you see people who are not Christian and you you talk to them is that they go, oh, Christians are so judgy. They're so judgy. These holy rollers are so judgy. Judge not. Didn't you read that Bible verse? Judge not. And and she has this this triumph, this triumphant look when Putty realizes that he too. He too is committing sin, and he too is in danger of the judgment. And you know what? Honestly, I don't think that that's necessarily an unfair representation of many people who consider them Christ- themselves Christian, uh, especially in the United States. Is well, I haven't killed anybody. I go to mass. Um. So yeah, I'm saved. Of course, I'm saved. I don't have to like follow the rest of the Ten Commandments or anything. I don't have to repent of my sin. That's just. You know, judgment is reserved for the bad people, and I'm a good person, even, you know, and I don't really have, my sin isn't that bad. Now, if you take this perspective where your sin is not something that Christ died for, you have a little sin, you only need a little Savior after all. I mean, this is, this, this does put you in danger of the judgment. Um, so, it is interesting, and Seinfeld... <laughs> There's other pastors and other Lutherans that I talk about. One of them uh, may be listening to this. That, that every time we talk, something about Seinfeld comes up. And there is insight in the show, insight into the uh, the problematic depths of human humanity, of the human soul. And it's presented as a joke. And there is a degree of humor about it, not in the sense that it's funny that people go to hell, but in the sense of the absurdity. In the sense of the uh, absurdity that, that Putty believes that he is safe from the fires of hell and he can commit as much sin as he wants to because he listens to Christian radio stations and has a Jesus fish in his car. Whereas Elaine going to hell is not his problem at all because after all, he's saved and Christianity is all about me, 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 and who cares what happens to anybody else around you? You know, I mean, I'm not going to craft a sermon series around it, but there is a a degree of uh, knowledge that can be gained from this, I think. But anyways... If, hopefully, you know, that was, I don't know if that was (laughs) educational, maybe it was entertaining. But I mean, where else are you going to go for a podcast like this, where you have a Lutheran pastor talking about furries and Seinfeld in the same episode, and I have not yet gotten in trouble for this, for having this podcast, so (laughs) so it must be a good thing, right? But yeah, good grief. This is, this is fun. Uh, This is fun. I love talking about the Bible. I love talking about the gospel and the fact that that you can talk about so many different topics and point to Christ at the end of this and the death of Christ on the cross for the forgiveness of sins. I it, it's wonderful. You can use this, you can use anything in your life as an excuse to talk about and to think about God's love for you. Isn't that awesome? The gospel is pretty awesome, I think. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this. God bless you all and take care.